When I talk about debt, in particular with the United States, but you can apply this in any country, I focus on the debt to GDP ratio because you can't really talk about debt in isolation without thinking about the capacity to pay the debt. In a simple example, if you have a $50,000 balance on your credit card and you're making $30,000 a year and trying to pay rent in New York, et cetera, good luck. You're probably going to go bankrupt or at least default on that card. But if you owe $50,000 on your credit card, but you're making $5 million a year, it's, you, know, you just write a check. It's no big deal. My point is you can't look at $50,000 debt and decide if it's a problem or not, unless you compare it to the income. And if it's too low, it's a problem. And if the income is high, not a problem. So that's why you use the debt to GDP ratio. The U.S. just hit $31 trillion national debt, almost all of it in the form of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, not all of it, there are other obligations, but mostly U.S. Treasury securities. Well, is that a problem or not? One way to answer the question is compare it to GDP, do the ratio. The answer is that ratio is now a little over 130%. At the beginning of the Trump administration, it was 106%. So Trump and Biden together have taken up 25 percentage points from 106 to 131. What was it in 1980 when Ronald Reagan was uh, elected? The answer is 30%. 30% is completely comfortable. That's like the person with the $50,000 debt is making millions, no big deal. 50%, yeah, getting up there. Angela Merkel and all her years in Germany, and there's a lot of research to back this up, says that 60% was the limit. And that's what the Master's Treaty that created the European Union and the European Central Bank. That was their goal. They said, don't go over 60%. If you do, you're expected to take measures, you know, raise taxes or you know, reduce debt or reduce spending, do something to get that back down under 60%. What's the critical threshold where, you know, water turns to steam or water turns to ice or something changes in such a way that it's not the same. It's radically different, but it happens very quickly. The best research says the answer is 90%. And your debt to GDP ratio goes over 90%. Your multiplier of an additional debt goes below one. So just to put that in context, at 30%, if I borrow a dollar and spend a dollar, I might get a dollar 30 of growth. You know, assuming you spend it wisely, that's a big condition, but uh, you borrow a dollar and spend a dollar and get a dollar 30 of growth. Okay, the debt was productive if you put it to good use. That dollar 30 gets smaller and smaller. As you get close to 90%, it goes to a dollar 20, a dollar 10, a dollar five. Past 90%, you borrow a dollar and you spend a dollar and you only get 95 cents of growth. You don't get your dollar back in terms of GDP. And then 90% and 85%, et cetera. So 90% is the critical threshold. The US is at 131% highest in history, which means we are well past the point where you can borrow your way to growth or you can borrow your way out of a debt crisis. And we were heading for a debt crisis. Now, debt crises of that magnitude, and by the way, if you ask a separate question, say, well, well who else is at that lunch table? You know, who else has a debt to GDP ratio of about 130% or higher? The answer is Lebanon, Greece, Italy. Those are your mates at the lunch table. You know, that's where the United States is. Now, Stephanie Kelton, she's the big brain of modern monetary theories, a professor at State University of New York. She says it doesn't matter. They always point to Japan. Japan is at 280%, way past any member of the peer group. China's probably higher. China's a little more opaque because they are, but also they don't have as much national debt. If you look at the national debt to GDP, it's modest, but they have an enormous amount of provincial debt and banking system is owned by the government or controlled by the government. When you throw in the bank debt, the state-owned enterprises, the provincial debt and the government. So that's the real national debt. I was in um, south of Nanjing. They had these ghost cities. You know, I went out to see them. They're real in the sense that, you know, it's steel and glass and copper and cement and asphalt and they got country clubs and hotels and luxury apartment buildings etc and then you look down the horizon not too far you know maybe seven eight miles there's another one and then in the distance there's another one they're all empty they're all empty but you can create 20,000 jobs for two years if you do something like that or three years or longer but all that money's wasted well, that's kind of you know tells you a lot about china but the point being it was all debt financed and a lot else besides Stephanie Kelton says it doesn't matter because you're borrowing in your own currency. So if you're Argentine and you're borrowing dollars and you print pesos, how are you going to pay the dollars back unless you have, you know, huge trade surpluses, which they don't. So they just default, you know, Argentina is a serial defaulter and everyone expects that. If you borrow in dollars and you print dollars, which the United States does, they're like, what's the problem? Just print the dollars and pay the money back. Well, that's true. 
If you print dollars, there's no reason to default on dollar debt because you actually can print the money and buy the bonds. But it doesn't mean nothing else bad happens. What about inflation or hyperinflation? What about a foreign exchange rate? You know, the exchange rate can collapse. And these modern monetary theorists show very little understanding of the international aspects. They treat the U.S. like a closed economy, which it's not. If it were a closed economy and we didn't have to worry about trade deficits, trade surpluses, capital flows, exchange rates, you know, foreign credit, you know, China owning one trillion dollars of U.S. Treasury securities, which they do. If you didn't have to worry about any of that, I think they'd probably still be wrong, but they'd have a better case. But you do. She says, well, we don't really need a bond market, a U.S. bond market. We only have a bond market as a favor to investors because it gives them a place to put their money. They say when inflation happens, raise taxes. By the way, they also say you don't need a tax system because if you can just print the money, why do you have to collect taxes? And their answer is we collect taxes to redistribute income. Okay, well, at least they're honest. I mean, that's kind of a socialist model, but they're honest about it. If you ask the typical member of Congress to define modern monetary theory, they'll look at you funny. They've either never heard of it or they certainly don't know what it means, MMT, you know. They're acting in accordance with modern monetary theory. Whether they know it or not doesn't matter. The actual behavior, let's go back to COVID, because we talked about the debt to GDP ratio. So Trump put through a $2 trillion COVID relief package. And that was when, you know, the Paycheck Protection Plan, that was 800 billion and everyone got the $1,200 check. And then at the end of December, at the very end of the Trump administration, they did another trillion dollars almost. And that's when everyone got the $600 checks. And now you're up, up to $1,800. By the way, those checks, that is helicopter money. What the Fed does is nonsense. But when it's fiscal policy, not monetary policy, and you're handing out checks, that is helicopter money. And credit to Larry Summers for saying, you're going to get inflation out of this. Well, Biden comes into office in January 2021. And he's like, not to be outdone. He did his own COVID relief package. That was another $2 trillion. And that's when we all got the $1,400 dollar checks they just handed them out and then later that year they did the trillion dollar infrastructure package and then just to top it off what we get recently was the um, just under a trillion dollar green new deal i call it the green new scam and the baseline budget deficit before everything i just described the baseline budget deficit was about a trillion dollars a year so take a trillion dollars for 2020 and 2021, add on you know two trillion for Trump's first package, one trillion for a second one, two trillion for Biden's first package, one trillion for the Green New Scam, and I think a trillion for infrastructure. That's seven trillion dollars on top of the two trillion dollar baseline budget deficit. So that's nine trillion dollars piled on top of what was at the time about a twenty-one trillion dollar national debt. So that's how we got to thirty trillion. That's that's how the ratio went from 106 to 131. These numbers are mind boggling and MMT says it doesn't matter, but it does matter. And it shows up the way I described earlier, which is it slows growth. You don't get growth. So best case for the U.S. is very slow, weak growth, which we saw up in 2009 to 2019. Worst case is you throw a recession on top of that, which we're heading for, and the U.S. will be in fiscal distress. What was new beginning in 1989 was supply chain science. And it's a combination of algorithms, applied mathematics, increased computing power, linear programming, and other techniques that could expand and extend the supply chains greater than had ever been done before. And enormously, and a lot of it, you know, people know about just in time inventory. Like I got a car assembly line, I got to put in the seats. I want the seats to show up like the morning that car gets to that point on the assembly line. So it's not sitting in a warehouse, not inventory, cuts costs, etc. Walmart invented something called cross docking. What's that? Well, it used to be a truck went to warehouse unloaded and another truck pulled up and you loaded the truck and it went away. But well, Walmart said, why don't we just go from truck to truck, skip the warehouse? And that's called cross docking. And then a Walmart store or Home Depot or Lowe's or you know, others, the store is the warehouse. I mean, the reason they're so big is because they're warehouses. So it was like, okay, let's cut out the warehouse, etc. Let's go to China for cheaper labor. Let's consolidate our number of shipping lanes. Well, all that was done and a lot more for one reason, which was to cut costs, transportation costs, labor costs, energy costs, inventory costs, financing costs, etc. The problem was there was a hidden cost. While they were cutting all these visible costs and reducing the cost to the end consumer, there was a hidden cost, which is they were making the thing more and more frail, less resilient, less robust, et cetera, to the point where if one section broke down, the whole thing collapsed. 
you know, I give an example of like a loaf of bread. It's like, hey, I got a loaf of bread in the store. Maybe you don't now because of what's going on. Well, okay, but a loaf of bread comes from a baker. It needs a wrapper. They're going to be plastic or paper. It had to get there by a truck. Trucker had to take the bread from the baker to the distribution center or the store. The truck needs diesel. You need a truck driver. Someone's got to make the truck. Let's go over to the baker, baked in an oven. Where did the oven come from? You know, where did the manufacturer get the tempered glass and steel to build the oven? Uh, and you need energy to run the oven. And by the way, where did the baker get the flour? Got it from the mill. Where did the mill get it? They got it from a farmer who grew the wheat. It also had to be transported by train or truck from the farm to the mill. And then the farmer needs a tractor and diesel and harvesters and, oh, and by the way, nitrogen fertilizer, which comes from Russia, etc. So the point being, there's an immense supply chain in a loaf of bread. When you go through, you know, wrapper, baker, ingredients, wheat, farmer, transportation, et cetera, et cetera. And every link in that supply chain has its own supply chains of, you know, where trucking firms get the truck drivers, et cetera. I came to the conclusion that the supply chain is not part of the economy. The supply chain is the economy. There's nothing you can think of that doesn't have a supply chain behind it. Now, that's true. And then you stretch these things immensely to cut costs. You've created enormous fragility and, and give me a real concrete example. You know, Germany's a major car manufacturer. You got Volkswagen, Audi, Porsche and BMW and others. There's several hundred miles of wire in a car, you know, with all the controls and hydraulics, and electronics, etc. You can't just like throw the wires all over the car. There are conduits, there are plastic conduits that they install and then they run the wires through it to wherever they need to go. Those conduits are made by a firm in Ukraine. Well, Ukraine's got a few problems right now, including war, and they can't get them. So BMW and Volkswagen had to shut down assembly lines for sophisticated automobiles, not because they couldn't get chassis or leather seats, because they couldn't get this plastic part. Because you got to put that on first, so you run all the wires through it. Okay, so war in Ukraine is a big subject in and of itself, but for the lack of a plastic part, a conduit, you had to shut down major automobile assembly lines in Germany. I could give a hundred examples, but the point is, in the name of efficiency and lowering costs, we've created enormous fragility and now it's all breaking down and it's going to be a big job, five to ten year job to put it back together. And then it kind of feeds on itself. It's like what happens when systems like this broke down. So for example, I like a particular brand of salsa, I like hot sauce, you know. This is a real story as this happened. I go to the supermarket and there's none on the shelf. They don't have it. I go back the second time, they don't have it. I go back the third time, they got in a case. There's like a whole case. But I usually buy two jars. Well now I buy 10 jars because I'm like, well, I don't know what's going to happen the next time. Maybe they won't have it. That's called safety stock. You buy some extra inventory. So I pay for that out of my pocket, but it's on the shelf behind me here. But the point is I'm financing safety stock in my own house because I can't rely on the store to have it in the back room. Well, what does that do to the next person who wants hot sauce? They don't get any because I took it all. And same thing happens to me and some other product and everyone's doing the same thing. So you can call it hoarding. You can criticize it. It is inefficient and it costs money, but that's how people react to real supply chain shortages, which of course only makes it worse because now, you know, who knows when the next shipment of hot sauce is coming in. I talked to the guy who probably the individual who single most responsible individual for the creation of the modern supply chain. He said, Jim, you have to understand it took us 30 years to build this. It took three years to blow it up. It's not coming back overnight. It's going to take five or 10 years or longer to create the new supply chain. So what I describe is what I call a college of nations. We're still going to have a supply chain. We always will, but it'll be like a club. And to get in this club, you're going to have to be a democratic, liberal society. I don't mean really the politics. I just mean those in the political science sense or the political philosophy sense. But it would be, for example, United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Western Europe, UK, probably India, you know, and other countries around the world, probably Brazil. But there'll be countries with shared value, good rule of law, good concern for humanitarian issues, et cetera, who will trade with each other. But it won't include China. Russia will be, you know, maybe they're in the penalty box, but China will definitely not be in it. China will have to construct its own club, whatever you want to call it, that would include, you know, resource suppliers in Africa and maybe outsourcing in South Asia. And there'll be some people who kind of play both sides and that's fine. But people say the U.S. is decoupling from China, which is true, but China is decoupling from the U.S. This is a second like nasty divorce, but both sides want out. So what does that mean? It means that relative to some base costs will be higher because Chinese have a lot, a lot they do is repugnant, but you know, they are the manufacturing hub of the world. That's true. It'll be more expensive to do it without them, but it'll be worth it. And the way I look at it, the Delta 
you know, the extra costs that we might pay at the store, that's like buying insurance. You know, you buy insurance on your house, you don't want anything bad to happen. But when you write the check to the insurance company, you don't think you're wasting your money. You think that's money well spent and heaven forbid if something does happen, you're covered. Well, it'll be the same thing in supply chain 2.0. Things might be a little more expensive, but will be much more resilient, much more robust. I can give you concrete examples because I can tell you the theory all day long, but I think the examples are much more meaningful. So Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation Corporation, biggest and most sophisticated semiconductor manufacturer in the world based in Taiwan, obviously, just announced two $10 billion plus fabrication plants that they're building in Arizona. And so there's $30 billion plus going into new fabs semiconductor fabrication plants, brand new, state of the art. It's going to take three to five years to build Oregon and Arizona. Why aren't they building in Taiwan? Well, because Taiwan's in the crosshairs of China. And there's something called the U.S. military as a doctrine. They call it the broken nest theory. If China invades Taiwan, either the Taiwanese or the U.S. or both are going to burn Taiwan Semiconductor to the ground. They're going to destroy it because they don't want it to fall into the hands of the Chinese communists. Taiwan knows that. It's like, okay, we are one step ahead of the Shushan. We're going to build new plants in the U.S. This is a concrete example of what I'm talking about, where we're still going to have semiconductor supply chains. They're going to have to get silicon and other components uh, from somewhere, but it'll be this club, what I call the College of Nations. We're going to cut our ties to China. We already are.